بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. Chapter six explanation of توحيد and the testification لا إله إلا الله. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى من تبع هداهم إلى يوم الدين. Uh, before we go to the food, and I know that everybody's waiting for the food, just like myself as well, this is the walima, and the walima should be fulfilled. So fulfilling the walima invitation, it has to be fulfilled. It's a comp compulsory upon the person, and this, there is a, a genuine reason that you can attend. So before the food comes, we will start with our book, Kitab al-Tawheed, chapter number six, according to our numbering. And the chapter now is the tafsir, the interpretation of the monophism Tawheed and the testimony, the kalima, that is Allah ilaha illallah, there is no God worthy of worship except for Allah alone. So this chapter is actually a chapter to explain the Tawheed that the author had started talking about its compulsion talking about its virtues, talking about according to that. So what is that Tawheed which is compulsory upon us? What is the Tawheed that has all these virtues that we have discussed before? What is that Tawheed that we're supposed to call the people to? So this is a interpretation and more interpretation of the Tawheed because there was some interpretation before, but this is to clarify the Tawheed. And he, in this chapter, the author, made as well from the Tawheed is that we should not call onto the prophets and the righteous because it will oppose and contradict the meaning of the Shahada, the testimony. So this is why he brought this chapter to follow the previous chapters in order to interpret the Tawheed. When there is a footnote, please read it now. The title has a footnote. The explanation of Tawheed is undoubtedly connected to two matters. One, de declaring oneself innocent from every other deity than Allah Azza wa Jal and disbelieving in other than Him. Two, aff affirmation of divinity, i.e. the right to be worshipped for Allah alone. Right. So basically he's, gonna, he's just given the interpretation of what is going to be coming now in a minute. That the monotheism, the Shahada, it has two parts. Part which is the negation, Ashadu Allah ilaha, and the second part, the confirmation or the affirmation, which is illallah. There is no way that you will be a monotheistic worshipping Allah except that if you declare clearly that you have no association to any false gods, and all these gods have been worshipped by beside Allah, they are not worshipped with haq, they are false worshipping. And then after that, that you are only a worshipper and a true worshipper to Allah. So there is negation and there is affirmation. Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Now. And the saying of Allah the Most High, translating into English, those whom they call upon desire for themselves means of access to their Lord Allah as to which of them should be the nearest. And Surah Al-Isra, verse 57, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ يَبْتَغُونَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمُ الْوَسِيلَةَ أَيُّهُمْ أَقْرَبُ Is there a footnote before I start? Not for that. Not for that. Right, this is the first verse that the Imam uh, Muhammad Buhar brings in the cha chapter title. So he says, Those whom the people who are committing shirk, they are the, those who are they calling upon. So those who are committing shirk, they are calling upon. Calling upon, يدعون, that means they are asking them. And usually is the ask, is the ask of things, of matters. But also it includes the asking, that means a supplication for worship. So those are the ones who are from the kuffar. They are asking those, like the ranchers, or the prophets, or the angels. They are asking in them what is supposed to be asked from Allah. Like when a person, for example, he asked Ali ibn Abi Talib to do things in the moments of, uh, for example, of need. And this is what the Rafi, what they do, 
cooperate with Hussein, cooperate with Ali, oh Ali, cure me, oh Hussein, uh, help me, all of that. Or like the most people who are from the Sufis who call upon the Prophet وسلم, and they poetry in that, they ask the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to give them something that only Allah can give them. So this is the supplication which we call it Dua Mas'al, that is asking for uh, matters which is to do with the dunya. But also there's a Dua Al-Ibadah, which is the supplication, which means worship. That is the one who is now supplicating to the one who is not God, and that is in, in a way which is to get closer to him by vowing to him, by making sujood or lukur to him. So those, the kuffar, when they do this, or the mushrikun, or even the Muslim, if he does this to the prophets or the angels or the righteous, so Allah is saying that those are the ones you're calling, they themselves are you know, get, uh, trying to get an access to get closer to Allah. And they see which one is the closest that will get them closer to Allah. So how can you, Allah SWT is saying to them, call upon someone who is himself in need, someone who himself is calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's actually seeking uh, access and seeking uh, a way through which that he will get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the link between this verse and the chapter title, which is the interpretation of La ilaha illallah, is actually to dissociate yourself from the shirk totally, so you don't call with Allah anyone, not even an angel, or a prophet, or a righteous person. For verily, those are the ones who are calling the prophets and the angels and the righteous people. They are not dissociating themselves from the shirk, but actually they are in it. So how can you call upon someone who is himself is in need? The angels are in need, the prophets are in need, the righteous people are in need. So they are not uh, self-sufficient. They are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can they suffice you if they are not themselves? They cannot suffice themselves. Right. The second verse. And he's saying, And when Ibrahim said to his father and his people, Verily, I am innocent of what you worship, except him who did create me. Right. Before I go ahead with explaining this second verse, also Allah says in Surah Fatr, verse... 13 and to 14 and Allah says to explaining exactly what is meant in the ayah in Surah Al-Salaq 57 The ones who you're calling upon beside Allah that is they don't find, they don't even own a qitrinah even something which is little they can't the reality of the ownership is for Allah If you call upon them they will not hear you call if they heard it with their own ears, they will not respond to you. And on the day of resurrection, they will dissociate themselves. Those are the ones you called upon. They will say, we've got nothing to do with you. They will dissociate themselves from what you have done, which is the shirk. That is, associating them beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And only subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will be, he will be telling you about this. So the second verse with Qara Ibrahim, Ibrahim alayhi salam, kan ummatan qanita, the one who had fought his people, if his people, some they used to worship idol, and some of his people used to worship the stars. So they were Abr al Kawakib and Abr al Asnan. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he had set an example for us how he had uh, negotiated and dealt with the situation. Especially he had a father who's called his Azar, his name is Azar. Not Tarih, his name is Azar, that's the correct name for him. He was upon the ship. So he had to fight not only the people, but also his own or class closest relative to him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us about what Ibrahim said to his father. Ibrahim Surah Zukhruf, verse 36. Wa qawm. And behold, Ibrahim alayhi salam said to his father and his people. I got nothing to do with what you are worshipping. Except the one who had fataran. Fatarani means khalaqan, the ones who had created me. And here this is a very a, a very special verse, a special, I would say, eloquent speech from Ibrahim alayhi salam, in which he had made the same interpretation of La ilaha illallah. Because there is affirmation and association. He started with the, uh, 
the, the negation. He said, Innani bara. I have got nothing to do. That is, Ashhadu an la ilaha. I've got nothing to do with what you worship beside Allah. And then the affirmation, which is Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. He said, Illa ladi fatarani. Except for the one who have fatarani. Fatarani, he created me. Allahu Akbar. When he says, Innani bara. Bara is, I've got nothing. It's not just to, I, I just disbelieve. But also, I thought nothing to do that. I am uh, getting as far as I can from what you believe. And إِلَّا الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي هِيَا الَّذِي فَطَرَنِي The one who had uh, created me. And in this, there is a two benefits that we could gain. Benefit number one, that is to uh, point to the uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, uh, singling him out in the worship. So that will point to him because he is the one being single with that creation. Nobody can create the real creations from Allah. So he said, Illa ladi fa'aran. And number two, the second benefit, is that to point out to the false worship of the idols and the statues which have no power to create. So, Illa ladi fa'arani, it will indicate that Allah is the one who is the real creator. And number two, that those idols and those Statues they don't create beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we find, as uh, Shaykh ibn Uthameen rahimahullah say, he says in his interpretation, he said, We find in some of the Muslim countries, and I found myself, and I saw it, are two prays, and he does give zakah, and even make hajj, and on top of that, he fasts Ramadan, yet they go to the graves, they prostrate to the graves, they make ruku to the graves, even though they are doing whatever they're doing from their ibadah, they are kuffar. They are not monotheistic and nothing from the deeds will be accepted. So they are from the ones who are upon the most dangerous things from the Islamic uh, nations. Why? Because they are doing shirk without them knowing about it. They think they are actually doing well. So this is a, an ignorance on their part and also it is falling short on behalf of the scholars of theirs because their scholars should really direct them and tell them instead of their uh, they are actually pointing out the political issues and all they are caring about is how to gain the leadership instead of uh, clearing them from the shirk as we have seen from the uh, da'wah and the methodology of so many partisans. I'll give you an example. Uh, Hassan al-Banna who is the leader of Ikhwan al-Muslimin who had, uh, uh, mashallah, brought lots of people out of the cinemas and, uh, and, and brought them from seeing TVs and everything. But he used to give them speeches uh, which is all of it to do with politics and uniting themselves. And their, their, his speeches were next to the place where Siti Zina, which is a shrine, been made for Zina, the daughter of the Prophet Wasallam. Yet he never spoke a word regarding this issue because he doesn't want to lose his supporters. And this is on the expense of his worship. So instead of telling the people and enlightening them, what you're doing there is shirk, he was not caring about that, he was just caring about uh, verily how to unite ourselves and have one vote and get the uh, Khilafah or get the leadership or take the, you know, the, the, the leadership from the people. And that is not the Prophet Sallam's job, what he has done in, the, in Mecca. Right, so here we say that the person who's a layman, he will only take from his scholar and we need, we need scholars who address this issue. We need scholars who talk about Tawheed because with Tawheed we'll have stability to the country. Is the food come? Has the food come here, Sheikh Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Shall we stop or? Yeah, inshallah, yeah. Okay, we'll stop inshallah and hold. But we'll not hold our stomachs. So you could go to something. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. We as we've been discussing, we've been discussing the <coughs> verse, which is verse number two, where it called Ibrahim wa Abihi wa Qawmi, inna ni bara'u ni ma ta'aloon illa ladhi fatawani. And also we benefit, as we have added to what we have said, we also benefit from this ayah that the tawheed will not be achieved if the person had worshipped Allah and along with him others as well. So there is a condition there that the Tawheed would be accepted is that to make it sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people according to Shaykh ibn Sabin and the scholars they say that the people regarding Tawheed 
there are three categories. One, which will worship Allah alone, and that's the one which gets salvation. One, which worship others on their own, and that's the atheists, and the others who are not really worshiping Allah at all. And others will worship Allah along with him, they worship others as well. They are the mushrikun. So, the first one is the only one which are muwahidun and muwafis. The third verse, and he's saying the Jews and Christians took their rabbis and monks to be the Lord besides Allah. <laughs> Surah Tawbah. And Wal Masih ibn Maryam. To the end of the verse. This ayah will be discussed later on in its own in a chapter. And we will be talking about it. We'll be talking about Hadith of uh, Adi ibn Hatim. Because this ayah when recited by the Prophet in front of Hatim ibn Adi, and he was a Christian himself, and the ayah says, Verily, those Christians and Jews had taken their rabbis and their priests to be God beside Allah and also the Messiah, the Messiah, the son of Maryam. So he said, Verily, Messenger of Allah, we did not worship him. We did not worship him those rabbis and those Christians, those uh, priests. He said, didn't you make halal what they made halal for you? He said, yes. Didn't you make haram what they made haram for you? He said, yes. He said, then this is the worship, which we call it shirk the worship in obedience, in vain. So, uh, the ayah says that those people, they were not commanded to worship their priests and their the rabbis, but only to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that they, uh, with humility, they worship Allah alone, the one who had created the Messiah, who created the priests and created the rabbis, and he created heavens and earth. La ilaha illa. Idam, la illa ya'budu illa liya'budu ilaha wa'ina, la ilaha illa. There is no God worthy of worship except for him subhanahu, absolving Allah. Absolving him from anything which is shirk. So this ayah is basically another interpretation of the testimony that the author had started with his chapter, which is Shahadat wa la ilaha illallah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah had denied upon those who had taken their priests and rabbis to be God beside Allah. So this ayah will have, as I said, an explanation later on in the chapter on its own. So those people that made the ahbar and the rabbis to be shuraka, shuraka prayer, partners in the worship, partners in the obedience. So whenever those priests or rabbis order them to, uh, to worship or to, to make halal or haram, uh, they will follow it regardless whether this will synchronize with Allah's command or not. They will follow their priest or rabbi. So Tawheed uh, also will, uh, in means of, which is a meaning of la ilaha illallah, it means that your Obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be on his own. Not to obey Allah and obey others as well. And we're going to be talking inshallah when we talk about the matters, explain a bit more regarding this. So you only obey the leader if he commands you to uh, do God the good things or to do something which would Allah be pleased with. Now, the other ayah. And he's saying, <coughs> And of mankind there are some who take others besides Allah as rivals. They love them as they love Allah. And another ayah was an interpretation of la ilaha illallah. He's saying from the people. From the people that means those people who are not monotheistic. Those people who are not following the right thing. They would take beside Allah and dada. And dada means rivals. And mid, the one who is looking like and that is why when the Prophet Sallam, he had heard this man saying to him when he was making a speech, MashaAllah wa shit, if Allah wills and you will as well, said, Aja'altani lillahi nidda, are you making me equal to God? Qul MashaAllah wa shit, say that if Allah wills and his own. Then he says, Yuhibbunahum ka hurmillah. They love them, they love these ones whom they worship, like they love Allah. Now like they love Allah is a two interpretation for us. They love them like they love Allah. That's the interpretation which is being translated in them. 
On the other interpretation, they love them just like the believers love Allah. But the first interpretation, which was the translation there, is more closer to what we believe is a correct interpretation. That is because of the following verse, because when says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبَّ لِلَّهِ And then Allah says after this, and verily the believers are more of love to their Lord. So if the interpretation which we chose is to be the correct one, so the ayah will be saying, and some of the people whom they take rivals beside Allah, they love them just like they love Allah, but actually the believers, they love Allah more than those people who are idolaters of Allah. Whereas the other interpretation, which says that I'm from the people who worship other than Allah, take them as rivals with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they love these rivals like the believers love Allah. And then Allah says, but the believers, they love Allah more than the, those people who they love their idols. You understand that? The second interpretation, I'm going to see it again, that from the people who take rivals with Allah, they love them like the believers love Allah, but the believers love Allah more than these people love their idols. And that's the total two interpretation of the said, which are valid, but the first one is more sound. <clears throat> so this is how these people, uh, they love other than Allah more or equal to the love of Allah. So what about if a person who loves other than Allah and he does not love Allah? SubhanAllah. And this is even worse. And we have so many people who are attributing themselves to the Muslims, who they're loving their awliya, the close awliya, close friends, they call them awliya, more than they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have seen with my own eyes, when the person was asked to make an oath by Allah, he would make an oath by Allah regardless whether he is lying or is saying the truth. But when you tell him, make an oath by your wedding, the one you believe that he is your you know, savior, the Ghawsh or the Qutb, he would only make an oath if he's a truthful person. So he's taking the, the wali is closer to Allah or more uh, uh, of to be, to be, I could say, uh, approached than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those people, as I said, they love their awliya. If they don't live them as much as Allah, they live them more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Sheikh, uh, he say that so many people of them, they come to Mecca and Medina, and they deem to, uh, or they see that the visiting of the grave of the Prophet uh, is more of a reward than visiting the uh, Mecca, the Kaaba itself. Because they find in themselves more love to the Prophet than they find more love to Allah, subhanahu wa And we only love the Prophet of Allah because of our love of Allah. So if, you, if it happened, had it been that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to love the Prophet, we would not love the Prophet. So it is not the love of the Prophet is supposed to be more than the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will never love the Prophet of Allah if he was not a Prophet. He would be just Salam Abdullah, a normal person, Muhammad bin Abdullah. So because we love him, because he is the messenger of the Lord. We love him because Allah, he said, you have to love the Prophet in order to love me. Because Allah commanded us to do that. So <clears throat> uh, this ayah is a test for those who make in their hearts from the Muslims that Allah other than Allah in the love in the love is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have also more people which they love things not as a worship, more than they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without them knowing. The ones who love, for example, the money, the position, they love the uh, you know the things of the dunya. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu had talked about, Ta'isa Abdul Dinar, disgrace and a loser, the person who's a worship of the dinar. Ta'isa Abdul Khamisa, Ta'isa Abdul Qatifa, Ta'isa Muntakas, Wa Ida Shika Lantakash, Falantakash. That is, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, he's a loser, and if he's been to be pricked by thorn, may Allah make him not to be saved from that. So, this is a person who is always his heart is preoccupied by the love of the dunya and the possessions and all of that. So, it's actually, it's a type of ibadah. And if the person makes an accounting for himself, why he was created, and then you will know that he was created for a greater, a precious, more precious value and target uh, and, and goal uh, and purpose than the purpose of collecting money 
and making more houses and cars and so on and so forth. So, uh, this is as well a call upon us to, uh, at the end of this year, which is the year of the 40 70, in the beginning of this year, which is the year of 48, to ponder and see what we have done and what we should have done and we, have, we haven't done it. And to as well attach ourselves to the symbols of Islam. One of them is to attach ourselves to the Hijri date, and it's very important, especially, and uh, so many of you have heard the uh, dilemma and the crisis, and I call it the big turning point that the United Kingdom of Saudi Arabia had adopted Christian date, if you didn't know that, three days ago, and that was really shocking, and we really forgot to speak about it on Monday. But very, really, uh, we know that the only Muslim country who uh, regard the Islamic date is to be a great thing was Saudi Arabia. And now we have that the Saudi Arabia adopted uh, of paying the, the salaries uh, in the companies and even the in, uh, government institution, uh, they adopted the solar system. And of course the solar system is uh, along with the Christian date which is the 9, 2016 and all of that. And it was a, a major news for that. And you know that when we talk about Ashura, that we should not be uh, following the Jews by, and we should not be as well imitating them by fighting the, the ninth, which is Monday, along with Ashura. But we look at the Jews, they don't really fast Ashura. And their Ashura is in their Talmud. And their Talmud, they talk about the greatness of that day, but yet none of the Jews, we don't see the Jews fasting on that day. The reason behind this, they lost the day. They don't know when is the day of Ashura because they adopted a system which is different from the system that they usually used to adopt, which is the lunar system. Once they adopted that, and it's only the Jews who care about their date, that's why it was easy for them, for the generation later on, to know, they don't, they don't know when is the actual. They forgot it. And that's, a, as I said, a turning point. So what's gonna to happen to the Jews is gonna happen for us. So, uh, uh, now, maybe it's not going to be uh, uh, maybe the case, going to forget about, for example, the day of Ashura, but wait, 10 years or something, and the generation will not know when is Ashura, when is the midday of Shaban. First thing will go, the midnight of Shaban. They're not going to know about midnight of Shaban. It's going to go. And the last thing will be Ramadan. They're not going to know which Ramadan is. Because as I said, Islamic dates, now we have to teach our children to adopt it, we tell them that the, this is the Islamic date. <clears throat> this is what we should be adopting as much as we can, because we can't run away from our environment. Uh, funnily enough to say that the ones who have complained in Saudi Arabia regarding the adoption of the Christian date or the solar system are the workers. It's not because of, well, from an Islamic point of view, because they only lose 11 days in the year. Islamic year is 200, uh, 354, whereas the, uh, uh, the, the Gregorian year uh, is, solar year is 364 and a quarter, which means they're going to leave, lose at least 10 and maximum 11 days. And that's why they complain. So they want a, a compensation for that. It's something to do with complaint because of the adaptation of this non Islamic date. Allah knows that. You know, Im imagine a, 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 a free country, a non Muslim country, adapting Islamic. Day. What's going to happen? Imagine, imagine. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm, it's not going to be happening, but I'm just saying. And the non Muslim country, the European country is going to adopt Islamic day. What's going to happen? They're not going to stop talking about that. It's being radicalized. It's being radicalized. That's the word. <laughs> so, uh, what is this all going to happen to them? Yeah? They're being westernized. <laughs> now, Allah understand. Right. Um, <clears throat> the love. In this verse, which has been mentioned, has types. Do you have any footnote there? We don't have footnote. Have there, no. Right. The love has types. The first type is the love to Allah. And this will not contradict, of course, the Tawheed, but actually it will complete it. And the Prophet of Allah, he said, the strongest of all knots in Iman, the love in Allah and the hate in the sake of Allah. And the love in Allah, that is to love the thing, you only love it for the sake of Allah. So whether it is a deed or whether it's a person, and this is from the completion of Tawheed. 
The second type of love is the natural love, which is the person who loves his father, his mother, he loves his wife, he loves his money. And when the Prophet said, was asked, who is the most beloved person to you? He said, Aisha. From the man, Messenger of Allah, he said, their father. And of course, the love of the food and the drink. And the third type is the love with Allah, which is the one that opposes the Tawheed. And that is the love of other Allah, it will be equal or more than the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we have a, a something that would, would, if for example, the love of Allah opposes or contradicts the love of other than Allah, he will give precedence to the love of other than Allah. A'udhu billah, that is a shirk that the whole chapter is all about. So, coming now to the hadith in Sahih al-Imam Muslim. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever says la ilaha illallah and disbelieves in whatever is worshipped besides Allah, his wealth and blood become sacred and his reckoning is with Allah, the mighty and majestic. There's a footnote there. Go on. And in his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, and disbelievers in whatever is worshipped besides Allah is evidence that it is not sufficient to only say la ilaha illallah, but undoubtedly that they must disbelieve in the worship of whoever is worshipped other than Allah. For example, whoever says la ilaha illallah and thinks that the Jews and Christians of today are upon a correct religion, then he is not a Muslim. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know why he sort of pick and choose to try, you know, give folk notes to whatever he likes. So I'm not really sure about this. He left a lot of interpretation which he did not give a footnote and then just concentrated on what you had nothing to say regarding that issue. But anyway, I'm going to take it on a good, good, uh, you know, opinion of that person who translated. I would say that yes, the hadith talks about he who says that ilaha illallah and also he kafar, disbelieved of what has been worshipped beside Allah, then he becomes a Muslim. That is, his blood and his money becomes lawful. That means unlawful to touch. You're not allowed to touch him. And his account is upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're not allowed to, uh, for example, uh, judge him because of what, he, of what he does. If he believes in Allah, he says, La ilaha illallah, and disbelieves in what is worshipped beside Allah. So he's giving an example, Shaykh ibn Uthaymi, rahimahullah. So it's not enough to say la ilaha illallah, but you have to disbelieve in the all worship, in the false worship, beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, he who says la ilaha illallah says, and he sees, for example, Christian Jews, Hindus, any other non-Muslim religion, to be, uh, uh, for example, that is uh, a correct religion, and they have the right to do that. They have the right, and not, I'm talking about as in choice, but they have the right as in correct, it's the correct belief for them uh, because the person is having the choice whether they want to believe in this one in Shafi'i, you want to believe, you want to believe, believe, you want to believe, you want to disbelieve in Allah, disbelieve in Allah. But to believe that disbelieve in Allah is a correct religion, then you're not a Muslim. Okay, so you're not a Muslim. And we have, unfortunately, that they, some people who are making this called uh, Close, getting close to the religion, what do you call that? Approaching the religion, religion approach. They're making the religion to uh, uniting between the religions. And they have to compromise lots of things in the aqidah of the deen. So we do have the thing to say to the people, you have the right to believe whatever you like. But uh, as well from my part of freedom, that I'm allowed to say that whatever you're doing, either the wrong or right, that's mine. And you say the same thing about me. Okay, so I believe that what you believe is not according to my religion, not right. But you have the right to do whatever you like. You have the right to do whatever you like. But I, for myself, I have the right for myself to believe. I'm not going to go on next to your ear and say to you, your belief is incorrect. I'm not going to shout at that. I'm not going to go to your house and, you're a kafir. I'm not going to do that. Okay? But I have the right. Okay? If you're being asked, is Christianity correct? I say, no, it's not correct. Is Judaism correct? It's not correct. Is it allowed to kill the Christian? I would say no. I could like the Jews? I said no. We said that, but it's not left correct. And homosexual is correct? It's not correct. It's not correct. This is my, my freedom to say that. Okay? So you say say about me, okay, something which is not correct. You could say that my deal is not correct. But if you say to me about me, I'm terrorist, is this correct? 
That's not a fact, is it? You're lying about me. Okay, you're not lying about me. So if I said, for example, to the person who's a Christian, you're a Christian plus you are, for example, a homosexual. I'm lying about it. I can't say that. I can't say, you Christianity make, uh, for example, you Christian, you make homosexuality or to be uh, right. That's not right. That's a false statement. That's not right. Because I know for a fact that the Christian in their uh, Bible, they talk about the sovereign that they used to do with homosexuality. So, so I can't fabricate lies against somebody. But I've got the right to say that whatever you believe in is your right, but I don't believe in that. When I say I don't believe in that, that means I'm saying it's incorrect. If you don't respect it, that you have the right to do that, but it's incorrect for me. Okay, just like you say to me as well, that, yeah, your religion is what well restricts your mind to something like this, and you're incorrect. You have the title, you have the right to do that, inshallah, but there was a Russian. There will be a judgment there. Who's going to be the correct and who's going to be the wrong? <coughs> and my uh, responsibility is to tell you about my religion in the best of preaching. And you are the one having to decide whether to follow or not. So those who say about the religions are to be thoughts. No, religions are not thoughts. Our religion are thought. Religion is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm talking about the Muslims who say that. They're not Muslims, they could ever say whatever they want. It's up to them. So our, when we they say al-fikr al-islam, well fikr, al-fikr, Islamic thoughts, not attacking Islamic thoughts, Islamic sharia, ya akhi. It's coming from Allah and His message. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He told His message what to say to us. Now coming to the issues. Issue number one, have you finished everything there? Yeah. yeah. Issue, and there's no numbering for those issues. It says here, in these issues, from the greatest of all issues, and the most important among them, is the interpretation of the Tawheed, which is the chapter title. Interpretation of the Shahada, the Kalim, which is La ilaha illallah. Or also he had, the author, had interpreted in a, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had uh, made it very clear to us. So this Tawheed has to have two things. One, negation of any false God. And then number two, affirmation of the worshipping to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here he's giving an example, Shaykh al Thameen, how the negation is important. If you, for example, said, Zaydun is standing up. Yes, you have confirmed and affirmed that Zayd is standing up. Zayd is a name. Zayd is standing up. But you did not actually in that statement establish the fact that maybe another person is standing up as well. Do you understand me? So if you said Zayd is standing up, yes, yeah, okay, standing up. But you did not negate that other people may be standing up as well. But if you said there's no one standing up except for Zayd, then you'll know that everybody is not standing up except for Zayd. So when we say there is no God except there, there, is, there is God, I believe in Allah. Okay, but you did not negate those who say there is another God beside Allah. So I have to say there is no God worthy of worship, because there are gods who are worshipped. But worthy of worship, rightly so, worship in the right manner, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there has to be negation before we make the affirmation. And then he says, in it, the Surah al ayat al-Isra, and in that ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made the refutation against the kuffar, the ones who call upon the righteous, and he said that this is the major shirk. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Udhruni astajib lakum. Call upon me and I will respond to you. The ones who uh, uh, are in pride to uh, not to worship me, they will enter hellfire with humiliation. So here, call upon me, call and supplication is the ibadah. Because the Prophet he said, Supplication is the ibadah. And when you call upon a person, this dua is of three types. Type number one, which is permissible. And that is you call someone with something which is within his capability, as we have said that before. And this is not from the dua of worship, but actually from the things which are permissible. So if a person uh, come to you as a physician, said help me to cure me, then he's asking something within your capability. Second type, is that the person he asks another person, uh, uh, whether he is alive or he's dead, something he's not able to do, except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And we said that before, as he said, he remember, give an example, come to a person and say to him, give me rain. Or make my child in the womb of the mother to be, for example, a male, make him female, or make him twins. This is shirk. And this is you making rival with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third type is that you are calling upon somebody who is dead and he does not respond. This is also uh, shirk akbar. You're calling upon him because he's dead anyway. And also in the ayah that the author had brought, or in her ayah to Bara'ah, Surah Bara'ah, Surah al -Tawr. In it, that the people of the book have taken the rabbis and the priests are to be uh, guards beside Allah. We're going to explain that as I said before. This is shirk in the ta'ah, shirk in the videos of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shirk is actually more of the category of rububiyyah than the category of uluhiyyah. Rububiyyah means the lordship, not the uluhiyyah, which is the worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, Whatever you are uh, differing regarding is the, uh, the, the, the you have to refer to Allah. So the, in this ayah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about the Christians, the Jews, taking the rabbis and priests uh, uh, beside uh, gods beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is actually is to do with that they are accepting those rabbis and priests to be uh, the ones who settle the difference, which is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so the shirk in a ta'as from the major shirk, and yet we have, uh, we have details in that issue. First of all, we say Shark al is of three types. Type number one, which is that the person, he accepts their sayings and he displeased, is displeased with what Allah had drew. This is a kafir. So a person who had done this following shirk, which is an al which is pleased with what his rabbis and his priests and his scholars and his sheikh, his wali, is saying, and he is displeased with Allah's rule. That's a kafir. Second type is that he is pleased with the rule of Allah, but but he uh, follows their sayings because of desires. So he is pleased and accepts the rule of Allah, but he follows their rule, okay, because of whims and desire. And that's a person who's rebellious, fasting. So he knows Allah, this is, this is haram, uh, for example, to fornicate. But he follows those things of you know, fornication for the sake of that whims and desire. And that's a facet. The third one, he follows those rulers, those uh, shiyukh or those uh, muftis or those judges and rabbis and priests because of his ignorance. Because he's an ignorant. Now, this one has detailed a sort of uh, uh, answer. If he's ignorant, then if he's capable of knowing the haqq and learning from the scholars, and he did not ask them, then he is a sinner. And if he did not have anybody to ask, okay, or he asked someone, but yet he gave him the wrong answer, then he has no sin, verily his sin is upon that person. Again, so he would follow those people because he's ignorant, so, uh, uh, and he is of course pleased because he thinks, you know, that whatever is the, the rule of their, the, the, their scholars are to be the rule of Allah. So if he knew, if he was able to know the haqq and did not ask, then he's a, a, a sinner. And if he was not able to do that, or he was given the judgment, which is wrongly, then his sin is upon the person who had given him the verdict. Then he says, وَمِنْهَا قَوْلُ الْخَلِيلِ إِنَّنِي بَرَاءٌ Rahim he said, I got nothing. Dissociate yourself. I've got nothing free from what you worship, O people. And he said that to his father and his people, except for the one who had who created him. And also, he said, in this bara, that is to have muwala, which is tafsir shahadati la ilaha illallah. That the, the interpretation of shahadati la ilaha illallah, Allah says, Allah made it in La ilaha illallah in his aqib, that means in his offsprings. And Surat Baqarah, 
in the kuffar, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِينَ مِنَ النَّارِ And then I'm going to get out of the fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He had made the love is to be shirk. If He had loved something or someone other than Allah, the way that He loves Allah. So He would be making shirk in the love of Allah. So you have to have the love solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one to be a participant in it or to share that love, even the love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For what he, had it been that he was not a messenger, that you will not worship him, we will not follow him, so you will not love him. Because uh, unless we love him just like the normal believers, like we love the, bro the brothers, but the love to the Prophet has emerged from the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, so then the author he says, how about those people who love the rivals more than the love of Allah? So he says here that the ones from the people in terms of love their Allah are out of four categories. Category number one, that they love Allah more than they love others, and this is Tawheed. Number two, they love other than Allah, like they love Allah, and this is Shirk. Third category, they love other than Allah more loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is even worse. And the fourth category that he loves with, uh, so he loves other than Allah, and there is nothing in his heart of love to Allah. And we could add a fifth category, which is even the worst of that, that is to live to love other than Allah, and he has hatred at the same time to Allah. And that is the maximum shirk. Then he says, He who says La ilaha illallah, and he disbelieves in whatever has been worshipped by Allah, then his money and wealth and his blood will become. Inviolable means that it's going to be sacred, cannot be touched, and his reckoning is upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, then he says, and this is what clarifies the meaning of la ilaha illallah. Then he says that you have to disbelieve, not just to say la ilaha illallah, with anything which is shirk and kufr. So he who has been accepted in the Christian religion or the other than the Islam religion is to be a proper religion, then he's a Catholic. Okay, so he's a kafir. So it's not enough to say that I say la ilaha illallah. It's not enough to say that. And I don't worship, for example, the idol Allah. No, you have to disbelieve in the worship of Allah. That you have to say that the worship of Allah is not haq. So to say that I don't worship Allah, that means maybe you're not bothered or not really having to say anything regarding someone else who's worshiping Allah. So, if you said, for example, I say La ilaha illallah, and I don't believe that Jesus died upon the cross. I don't believe that I should be uh, doing this, for example. Yeah, but uh, that is not really enough, because you should say that this is wrong. It's not just, I don't believe that I should be doing this, because that means you are not objecting on the people, not objecting, not, you are uh, pleased, or you are accepting of those people who are doing this. So. You have to be careful about that. Right. After this, alhamdulillah, we have finished the chapter and we are ready to chapter 7 in uh, next week. If you have any questions regarding what we have heard, I think next week is 8 o'clock, Isha. So, inshallah, we'll be after Isha straight away. Follow. So uh, this person is asking if we have been confronted by a person who's saying you Salafis talk about Tawheed, 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 want to talk about something else. Before I answer this question, would you like to ask him what should we talk about please, according to what you think? No, no, I want that person, I don't want you to ask. Jihad, Jihad? Huh? Talk about Sufis? Uh, the Sufis that he's saying this. Ah, okay, the Sufis have got nothing to do with jihad, by the way. The jihad is only waving their, shaking their head. Right, um, actually, the Prophet وسلم, he's the one who is our teacher, and how he had taught the people in those days. The most important thing is Tawheed. Because if Tawheed is straight, then alhamdulillah, you don't have to worry. But if Tawheed is not straight, regardless whether you are truthful, or you are a lovely person, you are a cuddly person, you are charitable person and all of that is not going to 
help you whatsoever. So the most important thing is the Tawheed. And the Prophet was the Rasul Amr al-Islam. The head of the matter is Tawheed and monotheism. Prophet of Allah, when he sent Mu'ad, Ibn Jabal, and he sent, remember, we just talked about it last week, didn't it? Or the week before, I don't remember, last week. Mu'ad ibn Jabal, he sent Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. What did he say to them? Talk about Sidq, talk about you know, how to be nice and to be memorable. What did he say to them? He said, the first thing that you're going to go to, you're going to go to people about the book, the first thing you're going to call them, Sha'arat wa illa illa illa. What did he say, Abu Talib, when he sent him to go and, you know, conquer an open Khaybar? He said, when you are inside, Call them to La ilaha illallah. If one person is to be guided through you, then it is better for you than the whole, or oh, the hundred camels, but the uh, house of the camels, or red camels, but it's actually better than anything it means. So um, we we'll say to that person, you have to learn, you know, you have to learn how we can call, because we are people followers. We're not innovators. You want to innovate, it's up to you. So, um, and the, it, it also, it looks like this words are coming from somebody who's got some malice in his heart. A grudge or good that he's, or he's ignorant, whether the two are this, whether this or that. He's ignorant, doesn't know, or he's got hatred towards the self. He's been pumped up with those Wahhabis and Wahhabism and all of that. By the way, we shouldn't be called Wahhabis, we should be called Muhammad if they want to call us, because it's called Muhammad, not Wahhab. He's not Wahhab, he's not his Wahhab, he's not his name Wahhab. He's Muhammad, the son of Abd al Wahhab. So the Wahhab is, by the way, originated not from the Abd Wahhab. No, no. I hate Wahhabism, but this is not the Wahhabism that the ones of Abd al Wahhab. And the history behind this. But anyway, that person, uh, you should say to him, you know, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going to be standing before the Lord for whatever you say. For your ignorance. If he didn't, if he didn't know, that's a crisis. And if he didn't know, it's more crisis as well. Okay, more crisis. So uh, you say to him, you're going to die one day. You're going to be questioned. Tell him that, he'll be scared. You're going to be questioned, everybody. Everything gonna, you have said, well, that word it could be enough to dip you to the hellfire. So why do you want to say things that you don't know about? Allah Mustafa. You know the question like this really, the, the people were not really following, it's a long story you're making. We only make this, the questions which are beneficial to the people. Your question basically is, is has had setting a scenario that it's, it's not there, do you, you understand me? And, okay, If you chase money, that means you love the money. The love of the money which is fitrah. Who amongst you hate money, please? <laughs> Anybody says you hate money? If you hate money, there's treatment in the hospitals. Because this is love. You have to love the money. Everybody loves the money. No, you say, I want to love. I love to be poor. That's a Sufi's mentality, which are corrupted. And of course, they lie about because we have a fatwa. The mentality of the Sufis, oh, he hasn't had a wash for the last four months. That means he's not touched woman. MashaAllah. I said, La Allah. You go to the hospital, brother. I think there's something wrong with him. He doesn't love him for four months. He didn't have an uh, intercourse with his wife for four months. For four months, he didn't have a wash for sexual defilement. <laughs> he should be saying, oh, subhanAllah. No, he's crazy. La Allah. La Allah. It's called Samarqandi, the Sufi. So, the love of the money is there, but the love that we should not be given to the money is to give the money priority so much that we compromise our duties towards Allah, our duties towards the, the, the family, our duties towards the wife, our duties towards our brothers, our duties to everything. If it compromises, then ah, the love of the money is getting now closer to be even close, as close as the love of Allah. But as I said, the money, as the Prophet said, Inna ma salah. the money be made for the salah. You cannot establish an Islamic country without money. There's no such thing. 
cannot establish an Islamic country without what? Money. You have to have money. You can't establish a proper da'wah without money. So, what did the Prophet ﷺ say? What did he say? So to Amr al As. Amr al As radiallahu He came to the Prophet ﷺ after he had embraced Islam. Messenger of Allah said to him, I'm going to get you now, send you to lead a squadron, an army. So you could win, and then Allah, your give your spoils, or booty, so that I will give you a portion. He said, Messenger of Allah, I did not follow you for that. I did not embrace Islam for that. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told you correct his approach. He said, Ya Amr, ni'mal manu salih, salih. Sound money is good for the sound person. The righteous money, the good money, halal money, is good for the good person. And that is why the people are for four categories. Remember? Two are good and two are bad. Two are good. One, Allah has given him knowledge and he gave him the money. Rich. So he spent his money in the way that would please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another person who's got the knowledge but he's got no money. He looks at the person who's got the money and I wish, oh Lord, I got the same money and I will do the same thing. They've got the same reward. Whether he's got the money or not, he's got the same reward. Because he had wished if he got the money, he would do the same thing. Another person, he has no knowledge, but he's got too much money. So he spends it and squander it on the haram. So he's really sinner. Another person, he's got no knowledge and he's got no money. And he said, if he got the money, I will do the same thing as that ignorant person. He'll squander it in haram. They are the same sinners as well. So alhamdulillah that uh, we want the brothers to, uh, to stay with what they're natural, but there's no harm for you to spend the money. There's no harm for you to use that money as much as you can. It's not on the expense of harming your family. Who is that companion who had said, verily, if I had a shop close to the masjid, next to the steps of the masjid, did you come up to the shop? I could go to the shop and make such and such thousands of money. And then I spend it in the sake of Allah. Huh? Wallahi, I will not swap it for coming to the masjid and pray. So I don't like to be offered a shop where it's next to the masjid. I will not be wasting my prayer. Go in the shop, come to the prayer. So my prayer is in full. But at the same time, as well, making money. And that money, I'm not doing it in squandering. No, no. It's going to be in charity. Give it halal, 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 halal. I don't have to swap that for coming to the masjid and praying. I said, then why? You're making money halal. And you're spending it in halal. And you give it to charity. And plus, on top of that, you are giving your prayer jama'ah in the masjid. He said, I don't want to be questioned on the day of resurrection. How do you get the money? How do you spend it? It's every penny that you spend and you get, you're going to be questioned for that. That's what he said. This we call it ascetic. You know what's ascetic? Zahid for dunya. Ascetic. He loves the dunya, but his love, he loves the, 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 the money, but his love to Allah is so much that this becomes insignificant. His love is there, but it becomes insignificant. But don't you ever, huh? Make your family suffer, have nothing to eat, and you say that I'm a sadic and I don't want and I divorce the dunya. For when the Prophet said, It's enough for the person to be a sinner who does not look after his family and provide his family because it's a duty upon him. Father. And the people will forget about Ashura, forget about Sha'ban Midman, we're gonna forget about we're gonna forget about Hajj. Yes, they're going to forget about Hajj. And he said, the end of the time. Because at the end of the time, the house of Allah will not be made Hajj to. It could be one of the reasons that what? Reasons what? You're lost. You're Islamic date. You don't know who is Hajj. You've got nothing. So there will be no Hajj. There will be the last thing. The Suwaitiya thing, the one who's got the Suwaitiya thing, which is the one who's got the two long legs. He's coming from Habash, from Africa there. A man coming all the way, nobody's stopping him. 
to go to dismantle the Kaaba stone by stone. One of the Muslims, they're not there. You know, dismantle the Kaaba stone by stone until he gets the treasure. There's a treasure underneath it. So this man, he has nobody to stop him. That means what? What happened to the Muslims? Finished. No Arabs, no Muslims, very few. So uh, uh, our uncle, when the Saudi Arabian had uh, 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 sort of now adopted this state, I was not surprised, but I was shocked how fast it happened. I thought it was not going to happen in my era. Uh, especially in the era of the king, because well, so King uh, uh, Salman, who is, you could see that he's a religious person, but this thing to happen, this is, could be from the Bitana, the confidence, when close to the king, who's was really bad. Um, maybe it's to do with well economical things because of uh, you know the, the petrol price the fuel prices are very low so they want to do something about it is one of the uh, uh, reason they adopted this is they say because of that but I'm pretty sure that the scholars they're not really approved of this but at the same time they will not tolerate for the people to hate their king no way they will not start talking to them, look at how this king and how change the adaptation, they were not that. Because they will lead to more chaos and they will lead to them uh, invoking the people and then later on making the people to go and fight their leader and that's going to lead to chaos, corruption. So they will not do that, but as I said, they will not approve of such a uh, step. Allah Musta'an, we ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, bring it back, inshallah. Now, khair inshallah subhanakallah wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka